So welcome everyone to I4J's eighth interactive video presentation Q&A session. It's a mouthful. Our illustrious founder, David Nordfors, took us a while to get him to uh, present something. But uh, um, certainly David's topic is topical. So David's talking about five billion customers wanting a good job and um, it is an untapped $100 trillion market for innovation for jobs. So we should all be concerned about this. My name is Ben Baldwin, for those of you who have not met me, and I'm hosting this series for David and Vint. And I started the series because I think we should all be sharing and helping each other. So I think that David will be a really good catalyst today to help us with that because he's not ashamed or shy of doing that. Um, just as a quick intro, this is not my day job. I am the founder of a company called Scale Driver. And what Scale Driver does is innovation consulting, which would explain my interest in this group. And uh, but instead of consultants, we match executives with uh, what I would call real innovators within a process that predicts innovation success and accelerates. So I like this video format in particular because it's a great way for us to introduce ourselves to the group and to share what we're working on in an in, intimate in way and maybe even ask for some help. And the technology itself, the video technology, allows everybody to interact in real time, ask questions, etc. So what I've done is I've put everybody on mute and all that I do is request, and I'll remind you later, request that you quickly introduce yourself to David. And um, even if you know David, please introduce yourself because the audience is uh, interested in knowing who you are. And if you, all you need to do is unmute yourself in the side column, or you can use the chat feature to ask me to unmute you. It works either way. And just as a reminder, this is an open link. So people from outside of I4J can join. So, uh, so with that, and just a quick reminder that we are recording the session. So if someone can't join us today, we can share it. Um, I will get out of the way and turn it over to David Nordfors. Take it away, David. Thank you, Ben. All right. So, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to speak today about um, how to disrupt unemployment. And actually, I think this is the first time I've done a slide deck for it. So, see what you think about it. So, uh, let's start. I for J, this is our logo. Now, this is what people see as a problem in the economy today. People needing jobs. That's considered a big problem. Well, uh, I'm suggesting that we reframe this problem as an opportunity. Uh, focusing on the word need, right? Because where there's a need, there is a market. And there's so much literature about uh, targeting the need uh, you know, inventing something that fills the customer's needs, uh, keeping customer loyalty, customer satisfaction, and so on. And I'm, I'm suggesting that, that all of this can be applied today to the need for a job. And this means actually that, that I'd like to reframe the word job uh, as a need. And because Today, people see job as a synonym to, uh, to employment. And I would like to say that, that a job is a need that the worker has, as when the worker says, I need a job, or whatever the person might mean by that. Usually, I need some stability to, to, to raise a family. I, I, I need something meaningful to do, uh, and so on, right? And employment is one way of trying to satisfy the need for a job. So, thinking this way, if we innovate jobs to satisfy the need for a job, we could think about good jobs as a service. I mean, you know, now everything is becoming a service. We have databases as a service, IT as a service, infrastructure as a service, uh, people as a service. I think that one is, is linked in and everything as a service. So let's see good jobs as a service. And by the way, if we think about good jobs as a service, I just wanna uh, take as a comparison, 
there was once upon a time a, a country called the Soviet Union where where it was a great privilege to be a customer for more or less anything and people will, would pull strings and bribe uh, in order to get the privilege of being a customer of a crappy service um, and nowadays of course um, the Soviet Union has become Russia and there is the, the services are competing for people instead of the other way around. If people have the money to buy them with, and this is all over the world, of course. Uh, and I'm, I'm suggesting that if we see the job market as a service market, we're still in a, in a very Soviet service market, that people are pulling strings and bribing in order to get a job. While... I'm suggesting that there can be good jobs for everyone, just like there are services for everyone. There are services that help us spend money better, and there should be services that help us earn money better. Both are services. So let's look at the market for good jobs as a service, then. So this is numbers from 2011, uh, and it's from Gallup. In 2011, there were 5 billion people on planet Earth of working age. 60% of them had paid work of some kind. Most of them wanted to have uh, what Gallup calls a good job, which means basically a full-time job. Uh, so 26% had that, right? So... Not many had what Gallup means by a good job. And, I, and, and actually only 4% were engaged in their work, meaning that they cared about it and they, they looked forward to going to work and they were passionate about it and so on. And what's more, for every engaged person, there, there was two actively disengaged people. In, in short, for every person who loved their job, there were two people who hated their job. And the rest were kind of lukewarm about it, right? Now, this global workforce created um, a market value of $75 trillion per year, the GDP, okay? So now if we uh, think about going to the, shall we say, post-Soviet uh, labor market, where because you can see here, of course, that this is like 4% uh, customer satisfaction in that case, in, in, in this case, right? If we see the job as a service. Um, if we consider, then, a competitive good jobs as a service market uh, with 100%, 100% engaged workers, uh, they have jobs competing for them to do, and they can choose jobs that, that match their skills, their talents, their passions, that are matched with other people in teams that they work well together with and that inspire them. Uh, and these teams are given meaningful work, that meaningful tasks that they like working on. So the question is then, if we have the uh, workforce today, creating $75 trillion uh, worth of GDP per year, how, many, uh, how much more would a 100% engaged workforce perfectly matched create? Uh, and I'm suggesting to you that adding, going from 75 trillion to 175 trillion is actually extremely conservative going from 4% engaged to 100% engaged, knowing how much difference it is being engaged at work. And also on top of that, uh, matching people with their own unique uh, profile much better than, than basically any, anybody is today. I mean, 100, and so that extra $100 trillion then we could say would be would be the market the potential market for innovation for jobs okay so 
Now, I'm, I should say I'm not a trained economist. I'm, I'm a quantum physicist. Uh, but here is my simple way of trying to understand economics, right? So in my mind, the economy happens when people need each other, right? And of course, there should be some mechanism for people to satisfy their need of each other. And if people need each other more than, uh, the economy grows. And if people need each other less, the economy shrinks, right? So, therefore, what we need innovation to do is to help us uh, create value for each other because all people, all people can create value for each other. I've been saying this since we started several years ago, and this is one of the statements that, that nobody ever challenged. All people can create value for each other in some way. We only need an economy that makes it happen, that makes people be able to create value for each other, right? everyone. So, innovation for jobs means then innovating new ways for people to need and want each other in more valuable ways. And uh, let me say today we are thinking about people, innovation making people need each other less. Uh, we see, uh, you know, experiments with hotels that has a robot in the hotel reception uh, and so on. And we discuss that uh, all jobs will be gone in the future and nobody will need each other. Well, that is because we are in a task-centered economy that where, where the prime goal is to innovate, to help people to get more for what they spend, to help them to spend less, right? Now, this is not constructive. I mean that we need to have innovation that help people not to need each other less, but we need innovation that makes people need each other more, in better ways, in more meaningful ways. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, we should innovate new ways uh, where the innovators earn by helping people earn better. Today, the main business idea is that you earn by helping people spend better. Uh, but, you know, people need to earn in order to spend, right? And as I just showed, the, you know, the, the maximum market size for helping people spend less is you can save everything that people spend. That's $75 trillion a year, then the economy is over. But if you help people create more value for each other and help them earn better, there is really no limit. There's no limit. The only thing is that we have to help each people to, to, to help each other in more meaningful ways so that they perceive they have more value for it. Otherwise, we get inflation. The, the, the amount of money should somehow correspond to the amount of value they create. So we need to create more value for each other. In this system, then, if, if I'm the entrepreneur and I help people earn better, and I also help people want each other more, then, then the worker is the customer, right? I'm competing with others like me, offering the worker customer ways to earn, right? Uh, the customer is the capital as well, with a, with, with a business model that I earn when you earn, Meaning that if I get, if you have a good talent and I manage to recruit you to my service, if we call it Jobly, which has been a generic name we've had for the scenario for a few years. Um, if you join Jobly, you become my customer and my, my offer to you is to earn better in more meaningful ways. If you have a talent and I can identify a need that would require that you learn a bit more. Well, I would invest in you by giving you the necessary training because if, if that raises your value so that I earn my money back on the training I gave you, it's good business for me. 
So the worker is both the customer and the capital here. Uh, so let's, let's go to an example. Uh, this is something that we're going to try to do with I4J, that, that all participants in I4J uh, can have um, a possibility to contribute to. Um, and, and quite a few already have announced their interest. So uh, we were, well, I can say this started with, with uh, Jeannie Kim Han, who who came to me and said, David, I'm a, you know, I'm a professional fundraiser for nonprofits and here's an NSF proposal and I think you should go for it. And I was kind of amused because NSF is of course more or less the most prestigious grant you can go for. And, and you know, I4J is kind of a loose think tank. I mean, why should we go for this? But she said, I, you know, let's do it. And uh, I said, okay. And this NSF program is NSF Includes, which was about workforce inclusion. So uh, we had this idea. Uh, uh, Jay Van Zyl and Charlie Grandwag and I had been sitting at an office, actually, a bit before Jeannie came to me and said that actually, you know, disabled people often have amazing capabilities. So uh, we should do something that can leverage on these capabilities, make a case for it. So we, we gave these special abilities a name. We call them cool abilities. So we could use a name for it. So the cool abilities are the values, valuable special abilities uh, that may co-occur with, with disabling of conditions that can exclude people from the workforce. And this is then uh, a promising market, we think, for entrepreneurship. And we suggested this to the NSF. Uh, I should also say that we, we partnered with UCSD, with, with Pradeep Khosla, who is the uh, chancellor of UCSD and also uh, a, a member of the uh, I4J uh, network. And he said, okay, I'll sign it and we'll send it in. And we, we actually got invited to make a full proposal, which we now handed in on, uh, on Friday, last Friday. And if this works out, uh, we will have a, a, a very nice offer for people to participate in actually building uh, a people-centered economy, uh, innovation for jobs market with a very compelling case that can give people some, you know, some entrepreneurs some very good opportunities to, to start new businesses and, and that they can earn very well. All right, so let's talk about cool abilities. Then. Um, if you think about, uh, for example, blind people, right? Blind people, uh, they still have a visual cortex in their brain. And that visual cortex gets used, right? Because the, the brain is an economical organism. It's only that it doesn't get used by the eyes because they can't see. So therefore, the visual cortex uh, gets reassigned to other things, right? And with that extra firepower, uh, often blind people can do things that people who can see simply cannot do. They, because they don't have the brains for it, literally. And this applies to very many different conditions, we believe. And therefore, people who are disabled are actually also coolabled, right? They're coolabled uh, because they, cool abilities really has some foundation in, in, in uh, research in, into the brain. So, so this is, this is the, the underutilized resource uh, because, you know, disabled people, they already have a stamp on them. I mean, they're disabled. They can't do stuff. They're excluded from the labor market. Now, 
but that's wrong. I mean, they can do amazing things. It's only that some things that, that most other people can do, they can't do. And the, these things are then considered requirements for, for getting a job, and then they can't get a job. But, you know, if you could use modern technology to, to create workplaces that, that don't require these things that, that they can't do, then you could create workplaces that could leverage on their cool abilities and, and you could create a lot of value for them. So in principle, if you could use, if you would earn more money, if you would earn a bigger profit on, on the value you could get out of these guys by, by leveraging on their cool abilities, then it will cost you to create uh, jobs that, that don't require them to do things they can't do. Well, then you're in business, right? So let's look at a bit at what we are missing here, the, the resource that is, is vastly underutilized. We let look at autism. Autism is a popular case. This, this is the case that, that the Cool Abilities Project is going to leverage on because it's already existing and it's growing fast, right? And here's a guy called Simon Baron Cohen, uh, he is a bit of the guru in, in, um, in this research around autistic people. And, and here's a paper he published in 2009 about talent in autism, where he shows what many people know today, that, that autism comes with, often with, with the ability to hyper-systemize and, and have extreme attention to to detail and, and also say very sensitive uh, sensory mechanisms, right? So these are uh, cool abilities that, that come with, with high functioning autism and maybe all autism, but uh, so far it's, it's the high functioning that, that the labor market is growing for. Uh, now here's a guy called Stephen Wiltshire. Um, and and he's one of these uh, few but famous prodigies um, uh, from the autistic uh, population. I should say not everybody is like you know, not everybody has superpowers in the autistic population. They, but they you know many of them are just better than the most of us others. Now, Stephen, he can go up in a helicopter, fly once over a city, and then he go, comes down and he makes a picture like this from his memory. And he has become quite famed for this. They, they fly him around the world, right? Uh, here is a girl called Iris Grace, and she's five years old, um, autistic. And, and uh, autistic kids are often treated with animal therapy. This is something that, that came a number of years ago because it turned out that they, they can actually communicate with pets better than with people, so they can establish connection with pets. Uh, so, uh, so this is Thula the cat that is next to Iris. And when Thula came into Iris' life, she started making uh, paintings for Thula. And, and here is one of the paintings she made. And as you see, this is, I mean, this is beautiful stuff. And she makes lots of it. And she, you know, she makes it for a cat. But the, this is very valuable stuff for many people. I, I would love to have one of her paintings on my wall. Uh, here's another guy. He's called Bram Cohen. Uh, he's the inventor of BitTorrent. Now, uh, he has high-functioning uh, autism spectrum disorder. So he was uh, very difficult to work with, uh, but he very good programmer, right? And he created BitTorrent, and he's also created himself a, a good life. He's got family, three kids. He, he's entrepreneurial. He started uh, events for, for autism uh, programmers, uh, hacking autism. Um, and shall we say Bram represents um, 
Bram represents a demographic, or, or shall we say, a group within the high-functioning autism spectrum that now is turning into big business. And these are this is in the IT industry because these cool abilities they have turn out to be then good for programming. Uh, and here are some of the examples uh, that are coming now. We have SAP has a program called Autism at Work. Uh, it's led by uh, Anka Wittenberg, uh, who is a partner in, in the I4J project, I should say, too. Uh, and, and she convinced the board of SAP that uh, by 2020, uh, by 2020, 1% of the employments uh, they do with an SAP should be from the autistic population, right? And they built several places around the world that then have created work environments where, where autistic people, uh, they do fine, right? And there are several other examples like this. Uh, Specialisterne is a Danish company, uh, one of the first perhaps the pioneer in this area, that do uh, IT consulting, and they collaborate with the SAP. Uh, uh, then you have um, Phil McKinney, who was CTO at HP for uh, personal computing division, and he, um, he started something similar at HP, and he's also the founder of Hacking Autism, uh, which brings together people in the spectrum to hacking events, right? Uh, you, you have other companies here that you can see that have started this, yeah? Engineered for testing. Uh, the, this company, they, uh, they, they, lev they then use people as testers. There is a, a, a special unit nowadays in the Israeli Defense Forces that uh, that they have for testing or for uh, interpreting uh, aerial photography and so on because of their marvelous sense for detail. For, for them, the difficulty is not creating algorithms. For them, the difficulty is how to take the bus home after work. So they have to find solutions to these things instead. And by the way, you know, I think that pretty many uh, leading CEOs today who, who can't who don't know how to take the bus home after work, and they are not considered disabled either. You know? So this, uh, we can find solutions for people. Now in this project and that we're doing, and I, I attribute this uh, table then to Charlie Granberg, who, who, who did the research uh, as a part of a proposal, and uh, she's gonna publish it together with Nurit Yirmia, who is uh, the uh, leading autism spectrum uh, expert in, in our project and also former uh, chief scientist for the Ministry of Science in Israel. So we're going to take three different uh, disorders and we're going we're gonna to look at the disabilities and we're going to look at the cool abilities. And th this, I should say, is a tentative table. This is uh, based on research or, or, or you know, anecdotal evidence and so on. Uh, and we're going to collect lots and lots of statistics uh, and uh, also collect a population of people who want to share uh, their abilities. And we're going to create a, a disability cool ability database where we can find the, the correlation between disabilities uh, and uh, conditions and cool abilities. And, and this can be very useful uh, for what we want to create then, which is a cool ability finder, we call it, cool abilities finder. And the cool abilities finder then uses this database uh, and works two ways. It of course adds also a, a, a layer that adapts to personalities, right? And in short, it works like this. A user states her disabilities, uh, and this with the database then and, and some personal questions and whatever else, the finder helps her discover her personal cool abilities because she might not be aware about them. Right? Uh, and then we, we create a marketplace around that where entrepreneurs can offer uh, 
jobs, education, coaching, other services. And th this then serves the, the market I was talking about, the innovation for jobs uh, economy with entrepreneurs uh, creating good jobs as a service, which, which includes also education and so on. So they found ways to earn on helping this untapped resource of people with cool abilities to earn. Uh, and, you know, the cool ability finder also contains things like matchmaker and so on. So the, this is the scenario that we want to build, which, which is the same scenario as I told you about earlier in, in the innovation for jobs. And, and uh, you know, I earn when you earn and so on. But here with a, with a real case. And the cool thing with this is that this is probably the best test case you can think about. Because people with cool abilities are extremely undervalued. Most of these people earn zero dollars, right? And, and um, I reckon that it's easier to take these people and, uh, who earn zero dollars and, and take them up to $150,000 a year or whatever it is or more. I mean, good programmers can earn a lot. Uh, then it is to take somebody who already earns 150,000 out in a competitive workplace and raise them up to 300,000. So for, for entrepreneurs into innovation for jobs, uh, this really is low hanging fruit. Uh, and the innovation here then uh, for entrepreneurs will be to find ways of creating work environments where people with cool abilities can become uh, attractive and productive with, uh, without having to be dragged down by the things they can't do. So, so uh, the innovator would have to find ways to innovate work environments that fits them, right? And then also the innovator would have to find ways to find new markets for these people because since these are people with rare abilities, uh, we can be certain that there are a lot of markets that people haven't even thought about yet that can be created for this demographic. So opportunity finding. So uh, here in short then is just a sketch of what the project would look like. Uh, the, the UCSD has been very good to undersign, underwrite this proposal. If it goes through, they will then uh, give I4J a contract to do everything in it. So we will be running it and they will be contributing with, with resources. And uh, you see in the directorate there, you have the core group who will be running the show. And you also have the, the, the steering group who will be overseeing it, that this is quality. And these are extremely senior people uh, in every way. And we have, we're thinking about having them, uh, you know, various meetings around it, uh, building a cool ability finder scenario during... Uh, interactive meetings of the I4J type that we already have. And by the way, we already did it in 2014 in I4J DC with a scenario we called Jobly, but that they're not for cool abilities and they're not aiming at the real life thing. So this is what we're going for. And if we get it, uh, we look very much forward to making this happen. And that's my, that's my presentation for you today. Now stop share. Here I'm back with you. Oh, that's great. Thank you, David. Now, um, thank you very much. So what I'm going to do now is just I noticed that there are a couple questions that have popped up in the in the chat, and uh, all I'll ask you to do is um, if there's not enough that I think it's going to be a crazy or anything. Just um, ask David a question, but please introduce yourself first and. Uh, unmute yourself. So I'll turn it over to whoever wants to go first. Steve. Steve Denning. I, uh, I write about uh, innovation and uh, agile management. And um, a great presentation, David. I mean, really interesting. And um, I'm just wondering uh, to what extent you've tested this out on a very small scale. I mean, you're talking about a management structure that appears to have 12 directors or equivalent, which is a fairly hefty management structure. Um, 
I'm just wondering uh, whether one might sort of start on a very small scale, try out the thing, and then maybe move over time towards uh, such a such an elaborate structure. But um, is 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 this part of your plan to sort of iterate um, and uh, figure out how this thing would work, uh, or do you start out with this elaborate, uh, fairly heavy structure right from the start? No, no, it's it, it's iteration. Uh, and and if we talk about the uh, if if we talk about the project uh, management structure, it, it, you know we we basically uh, like five people, uh, and and we're going to organize some meetings, and we have a steering group. That's even if it looks impressive on the diagram, but the the management structure in the economy as such, uh, and building the marketplace uh, that the the coolabilities finder means. This is going to be iterated, of course, and and we're happy to have along uh, in this project the the the, the Hasso Plattner Institute in Potsdam uh, for design thinking with, with Christoph Meinl and his team, and and Christoph is also uh, on the board of of the Stanford D School, uh, so we we thought of applying. Uh, a, a design thinking kind of philosophy to developing these things. Um, and I should also say the, the NSF project is a, um, is a pilot project. So they will, after two years, they're going to select some of the pilots uh, and leverage them to alliances that are going to get uh, Two and a half million dollars each for them five years to come, and and uh, you know, as Jeannie kind of pointed out originally, she thinks that if we make it there, we'll have pretty good chances to uh, to get that alliance because you know I4J already has such a powerful network. Um, th does that answer your question, Steve, or did I shoot beside the target? Um, well, I'm I'm still uh, a little a little unclear as to how the the timing would work. And um, okay, uh, I mean when you're talking about two and a half million dollars, sort of up front, without uh, as far as I can see having a uh, a test on a very small scale that this actually works right in, in the real market seems seems like a uh, to me a sort of initially. A question about whether the, the the whole thing fits together in terms of yes, rating towards something that works. But so, I, maybe I don't understand the plan. No, so so the so the test is in the two first years, right? So that then it will be developed with iterations, and and we already have some uh, participants in the project, uh, li like. Um, uh, you know, Alan Blue from LinkedIn is interested, and he is obviously, you know, LinkedIn could plug into uh, plug into the Finder, uh, and and uh, to create a LinkedIn profile for this demographic is is one thing you could do. You could uh, you could you know also do some kind of certified skills for people with cool abilities as well. Uh, another another uh, guy who signed up or uh, is volunteering is is Patrick Llewellyn, who is the the CEO of Ninety Nine Designs, and um, uh, you, you know, looking at the examples we've seen here, there there's a whole demographic for Ninety Nine Designs that can be extremely interesting. So uh, much of it. Then in the initial phase is going to be that that uh, Halle Grandwagon and and the team uh, that she will be working with will identify data sources that can help us build the correlation database so that we can tell people like Patrick that we we have identified uh, cool abilities and they are these cool abilities and they accompany these disabilities. And it gives then entrepreneurs a, a, a picture of, uh, you know, what is the resource they they could make use of, and in that case, which kind of 
of uh, challenges would they need to to help uh, the the people they want to work with to handle in order to deliver the deliver the cool abilities and this will go on for two years and uh, it, it will definitely be a pilot and it will definitely be iterations and uh, even during the next phase since this is an NSF project it, it's still research you know so uh, I I think that that if we can start a market a really working market by then it, it's fine uh, but I can also see that the iterations will will continue uh, the only thing is that the the NSF should by two years have, have seen that we have performed well enough uh, to get the continued mandate David this is Mike Nelson uh follow on to that uh, I was going to ask whether you had LinkedIn engaged and you just said that you did it yeah. seems to me that's fu fundamental I mean you're gonna have to have a pretty large population to draw from to find any useful correlations and to have any success um, the challenge of course is that people who have what are often called disabilities for instance dyslexia don't put that in bright letters on their LinkedIn profile. Right. So it seems to me you have two challenges here is, is how do you get people to engage without necessarily revealing that they've been diagnosed as having one of these disabilities. And, and it seems to me one way to do that is to just focus on the cool abilities. Right. But then you have to have a validation technique. You have to have a way to certify that somebody actually has the cool ability, whether they have a disability or not. Right. There are plenty of idiot savants who have skills like the ones you've mentioned that don't have one of the three disabilities you're lo focusing on. But right. I, I, I do think there's a way to do this, but you're gonna have to have a certification process. And I, and I don't see how you're gonna do that. So I right. want to hear yeah. more about how you're going to do that. So we, we have two ways of doing this, right? Uh, one, one is uh, literature search, because there has been done a fair amount of, of research on it. And we have already collected, uh, you know, a fair amount of references. Uh, there, there are even people who've done this in a smaller scale for, for autism alone, right? So, uh, that that's one way that we kind of tap we fetch the data through through data mining and, and literature the other the other way is that uh, we're going to organize in the beginning we're going to organize a, a a get together a conference for people with these conditions that have uh, succeeded extremely well professionally and uh, you know it's like people who, who've succeeded very well professionally like Bram Cohen uh, they can often be more open about their condition because nobody's gonna say that they can't do anything and actually it makes them even more cool so we uh, will gather a, a conference with with such leading personalities that just tell their stories and uh, and it can be a nice conference to be at, you know, people telling their stories and, and mingling, and then then we uh, we tie them up to the network, and they can give us recommendations as well. But I guess what I'm saying is, you should invite people who have some of these cool abilities, yeah. who haven't identified themselves as having dyslexia or autism, because maybe they don't. Right. Uh, so it's it, it. I think you actually do more good by showing that there's a Venn diagram here yeah it's not like you know go out and seek people with dyslexia and then hope they have the cool abilities well you see you see uh, I, I, I do think that those those success stories are not universal right I mean there's a lot of people who have dyslexia who are still reading at uh, fourth grade reading level and well, they haven't, they haven't found a cool ability, or maybe they don't have a cool ability. 
So, so I, I, yeah. I, 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 and, and getting back to my previous point, whether people have a disability or not, you're going to have to find some kind of testing technique to validate that somebody meets your criteria for one of your four or five cool abilities. Right. So we, there might be more cool abilities than four or five. And, and as we define it, they are, they, they are the counterpart of disabilities. And there is a reason to why we define it as that. Uh, but because, you know, the, this is about addressing an, uh, uh, and if you have somebody who has an amazing ability without having a disability, this person is probably already going to be employed somewhere. But so the, uh, I, I think the important thing here is to, to change the discourse around disabilities because these are people who are very able, but by calling them disabled, by labeling them as such, even if I would say, Many disabled people have amazing abilities. I've already said in that sentence that they are disabled. Right? So I, I imagine that we, we bake disabled into the word cool abled and we talk about this population and their abilities. So we, we can have a full language. Uh, we can talk about their disabilities, that they need help. Uh, in order to manage, and we can talk about their cool abilities that uh, that are a, a valuable resource. And it is because of the disabilities that the cool abilities are an undervalued resource in, in this language. But my point is that the people who have the cool abilities but not the disabilities yeah. could actually help the people who have both. And they, well, can, they can be mentors, they can help them find the jobs that they, in fields like they found jobs. I mean, I, I just, I, again, I, I, I worry that you set this apart and you say we're only serving the disabled community, you, you miss a bigger bet. Well, I, I, in this part, I, I, I think we simply don't have the same view on it because I, I want to. I want to. I want to, for the sad reasons, uh, pair uh, cool ability with disability. Just like you know, you've got word pairs. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got something. You know, uh, I don't know. What the, I don't get it into my head right now. Yeah. But, but still, you, you. I want that to be a word pair: cool ability, disability. And then you can have, uh, you know, for people who don't have a disability uh, who just are very talented in something, I think we already have a language. Uh, that I don't think that they are, I don't think people who don't have a disability and are very good in math are, are helped. Uh, I don't, I don't. No, no, I'm not, I'm not saying that you're serving them. I'm saying they can help serve the disabled. Oh, they, they can. But, um, and, and, and when you organize your conference, Reaching out to some of those people, and you know, would I think also be helpful. I, I, I just I, I worry that if we if we portray this as you got to be disabled to have a cool ability, then you've also sent the wrong message. Well, I, I I think we can say that because we do it as the counter word, and a cool ability means uh, uh, an extraordinary ability. So a person without a disability would have an extraordinary ability. While the people with a disability, you could call it the cool ability, which is an extraordinary ability that often accompanies a disability because there's a statistical connection, yeah. which, which then, and the statistical connection identifies a potential market for an entrepreneur. Okay. Well, again, it's a marketing question, but uh, you're going to have to have a way to identify these people. And I think yes. that having having comparisons with people outside the disability community will help you better develop the criteria for identifying them. But that's, that's another discussion. So, so my, my, Mike, you are hereby invited to chair that track <laughs> conference. I was waiting I, for that to happen. Yeah. It took, it took you a little longer than normal though, David. Um, <laughs> 
I have a quick, quick uh, question for you, David, before um, Cosman, who wants to ask you a question. Have you talked to Oracle yet about their information that they collect on candidates? Because there's some information that they collect about, uh, um, that they collect from everybody. I, I, I say they, any applicant tracking system to meet um, the standards of the EEOC and OFCCP. They're collecting this data. They strip it of identifiable um, that they keep it they keep it aggregated, but they strip it of being personally identifiable. They may be an interesting um, source. Yes. yes, we would love that and other sources. And by the way, uh, on top of that, uh, the uh, UCSD has a has a center for autism, and uh, we envision as uh, we might ask UCSD if we can work with with voluntary volunteer students uh, at the UCSD. So I think we, we have a lot of those. But I think that, as you say, Ben, uh, if we can have access to Oracle's database or any other database of that kind, this this is pure gold. They, I mean, it's, it's for large companies, and often people apply to multiple large companies. Yes. So there's a redundancy yeah. of data, and it's been tracked for decades, yes. um, they need that data. They have to track it by law. So there should be lots of data there. Um, I don't know how useful it is to specifically what you're doing. But anyway, I just thought I'd raise that problem. Well, well uh, we'll look at it. Mm. Okay. So over to Cosman, who's been patiently waiting. And I'll just remind everybody we have about four minutes left. OK. So no, I, I have um, a comment. And I'm glad that I uh, actually heard the questions before so one thing is that yes a testing is needed and it's not that hard to create one um, number two um, and then also there is data already that what you said about Oracle there's there's plenty of data number two is that I think that what I don't know in terms of marketing and who do we market and who do we want to convince and what kind of marketing we want to do um, because yeah if you use a classical style of marketing, then you just have to kind of, you know, brag about it and just make it this, make it that. But I think that here, for example, what I know about people who cannot read or spell correctly is the following, that there is more and more research that shows that reading a line from left to right on right to left is actually a forced disability because we're born with a brain that sees images and assembles them in puzzles. This is what we do as, as humans. The fact that we get forced into reading a line and just as, you know, that's a good exercise for the brain, yeah, to assign symbols. But think about languages like Japanese language or, you know, they, they have, see, have a very different view of the world that in my opinion, is much more uh, congruent with how we're born. So now that's what I'm, I think that that's, for example, what happens in that's, I, I, I do, I did have clients and I do work with clients who, um, you know, they're 35 years old and they have troubles and they're ashamed that they can't read or spell or whatever well, but they are amazing people. They are probably smarter than, I don't know, many other people who just got on top of a, uh, you know, of a school or whatever, just because they, you know, they follow the, the, the cycle. So I think that there is room for everybody. So that, that's all that I, I wanted to, to comment on that. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, maybe point uh, to Halle Grandwag to follow up on Cosman's comment there. Do you have any thoughts about that, Halle, what Cosman just said? Halle is the one who does the social sure. science research in the Colabilities Project. Yeah, I think that what we're facing, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I think that what we're facing is um, something that has been not maliciously, but happening systematically uh, for some populations. So what you just mentioned, Cos Cosmin, about people with dyslexia, let's say that they have to um, finish school, <laughs> and do the SAT, and the SAT is designed for people who read. Now, the accommodations that people with dyslexia get 
are a little bit more time, maybe somebody who reads the, um, the test for them. Our, our whole education system is designed in such a way that is actually leave people who are talented behind, and it's not maliciously, it's just because the lens of the perception of the people who design the, the education hasn't been widened yet to the perception of people who are neurologically wired differently. And now we all have different perceptions, our own perceptions, and sometimes we are convinced that our own perception is the only perception, and that's not the case. So I hope that make, that is clear, or um, if you have more questions, I'll be happy to answer. Right. Yeah, our perception, you know, I think that 90% of the time we're convinced that our perception is the only good perception. I think that that's what also gets us in trouble from politics all the way to personal relationships. But, well, I, you know. I would like our perception to change in order to give people who are very talented a chance to show how talented they are in fields that we thought they were not. So a person who cannot read can definitely be a star in engineering. But they don't even get to the engineering because they wouldn't make it through school. So uh, this is just one example. And there are more and more people coming out now with their personal stories of what they had to go through in order to become who they were. And these are pretty difficult stories, a lot of resiliency, but nevertheless, many barriers that one can at least bypass by, by some small changes and some bigger changes. And from the entrepreneurial point of view, I think that there's a market in, um, in design and there's a market in uh, HCI. So if I am taking a course, an, uh, an online course, and I want this online course to be adapted to my perception, I'll be very happy if it's not only for people who are neurotypical. So that I, am, I can be a client here. There, is a, there are many clients who would love to do that. So that's one, uh, one example. And then there are a lot of um, instructional design. I mean, there are, things are happening. It's not that th these kids are excluded from, from, from school. It's that this, whatever they're doing in school is not delivered to the universities unless they advocate for, themse for themselves and they do it, maybe 17% do that and they grow up ashamed and it's a, it's, a, it's a waste of, it's a waste of talent and we don't know where the next talent is going to come from. Okay, so, so here, here is maybe where I can uh, round it off by, by saying that uh, I got my PhD in physics without reading straight through one single book. And I, I actually had a bit of a bad conscience about it because I felt maybe I'm a bad student, right? I, I, I took the, the tests that uh, they handed out to practice on and I, I, then I, I started solving them and then I went into the book to read what I needed to solve that specific problem. And this is how I learned to do the tests, right? And to get through them. And I felt that was a bit like cheating and it wasn't the way it should be. And later on, I, I still don't read many books. So all these people come up to me and said, oh, you read, they read the book by the economist this or the economist that and so on. And I, I, I truthfully say, no. Uh, and and you know people can be shocked, but this is a famous person, and so on. I tell them that that uh, well, I I learn about this by talking to learned people like you. And the thing is that that uh, it, it seems that um, I was tested slightly positive on ADD, where all this sort of is in the spectrum 
I mean, it, it comes with ADD that you aren't very good at reading books. And uh, it also turns out that people with ADD pretty often are entrepreneurial. And many entrepreneurs don't read books very much either. And that it also said that it can come with an ability to see the bigger picture. And I noticed that I could, you know, I, I could actually always as a student um, and later on, if I have two pieces of information, I can see the link between them, even if most other people can't see the link between them. Uh, and I can get a, almost immediately. So, uh, and, and uh, I could, for example, see half a minute on TV or from a movie I hadn't seen, but which I knew was out there. And I could, I could nail the movie because I saw the type of the narrative, the type of setting, and, and you know, I matched it together with what was like the cliches of the day, right? Okay, fits with that. And I usually nailed it. So, so you know, I've come to, by, by, it, it's been helpful for me to, when people say you probably have ADD, because then I have an excuse <laughs> You know, or maybe not even an excuse. I have a reason, right? And at the same go, I, I feel confirmation about my other skills because that comes with it. So, I mean, for me, in this case, the, the, the terminology ADD has not been damning in any way, but it has been, uh, it has been kind of forgiving and enabling. That's uh, probably a good, we're about six minutes over, but I didn't want to interrupt either of you oh, as you were finishing okay. off because it was, okay. it was great. It was capturing the spirit of all that we've been discussing. So um, I want to say thanks to everybody. Thank you, David. This has been, uh, it's been awesome. And uh, stay tuned for our, for, our next, for our next session. We have Bob Cohen followed by Daniel Pianco then we have Steve Denning. So the question remains, when are you, the collective you, um, presenting? And anybody can present twice if they want. So I want to say thank you to everybody, and especially thank you to David. Thank you so much. And, and Ben, thanks so much for organizing this series. My it's, pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everybody.